Good morning and welcome to EGU 22, the annual meeting of the European Geosciences Union. As many of you already know, this is the union's first hybrid general assembly where we are bringing back our on-site experience for those of you joining us here in person, while at the same time introducing new concepts from the last couple of years to include our virtual attendees as much as possible. This year, we have had more than 12,000 abstracts submitted to EGU's meeting. And during the press conferences, we'd like to highlight some of the most unique studies, which, as you'll soon see, have impacts on local communities, industries, ecosystems, and the global environment. I'm Gillian D'Souza, EGU's Media and Communications Officer, and I'll be hosting this week's press conferences. Each press conference will have time for speakers to make their presentations, followed by question and answer period at the end. For those of you joining us virtually, I ask that you all mute your mics throughout the briefing until I call upon you to speak. If for some reason you experience technical difficulties, you can try to rejoin the session or look for more information on the press conferences section of the media.egu.eu page. A last couple of things to note, please save all of your questions to the end after the speakers have finished presenting. During the Q&A period, we will take questions from journalists, both in the room and online. If you're in the room, please raise your hand so that we can pass a microphone over to you. And if you're joining us virtually, please use the hand raising function of the Zoom platform so we can come to you for your question. If you prefer to type your question instead, that's perfectly fine. Feel free to do so in the chat. All right, so I'm now going to go ahead and introduce our panelists to make for faster transitions between them. This press conference is titled To the Boiling Point, The Far-Reaching Effects of Climate Change. Our speakers for today are Andrea Haman from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC Working Group 3, Guneri Lekuzane from the Inter -panel, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC Working Group 2, Jan Peter George from the Tartu Observatory Faculty of Science and Technology, University of Tartu. Jean O'Dwyer from the School of Biological, Earth and Environmental Sciences, University College, Cork, Ireland, and the Environmental Research Institute, University College, Cork. Leah Rapella from the LCS, LSCE Laboratory of the University of Paris-Saclay. And Lizette Clock from the Amsterdam University, of Applied Sciences Technical Department, Netherlands. All right, so now we are ready to move on to our presentations. Um, we will have Andrea begin for us today, and then we will swiftly move on to the others one after the other. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, good evening, whatever you are. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, it was a real challenge and an honor to participate in drafting the latest uh, IPCC report of the working group number three uh, that was released uh, last April. Um, I know you're aware and you have seen all the slides of the original press conference, so I wanted to touch on a few things that are important to me. Uh, I was a lead author in the energy system chapter, so uh, my interest relates a little bit to energy systems. Mm -hmm. Next one, Maybe try. just to click, nope, it's not, uh... yes, please, please do, next slide, please, yes, so I think the, mass, the most important message of, of this report is that we are not on track uh, to limit warming to one and a half degrees. Um, and you have seen most of the explanations regarding to this. Um, next slide, please. And that if we look at the policies that were implemented by 2020, we can conclude, next uh, slide, please, next, uh, is that if we keep on with the implemented uh, in 2020, we will reach uh, a temperature of three and a half, uh, 3.2 degrees by the end of the century. 
uh, both by uh, greenhouse gases and, and other um, gases like methane. Um, in other scenarios, and you can see them on the curve here, uh, we have other scenarios where if we start right now uh, implementing some of the mitigation that uh, propositions that are in the report, we could uh, uh, reach, uh, for example, a one and a half degrees. But the main, re the main conclusion of the report is that we need to start yesterday and uh, not in the future. Next, please. Next, next. Um, but uh, the uh, future is not so grim, and we can see that uh, certain things are really picking up. Uh, the price of PV panels and the price of onshore uh, energy has really dropped in recent years. And not only the prices, but also the implementation, how much people are using these technologies. Next, please. And not only we can look in the energy, but in all the different uh, energy land use industry, all these uh, different sectors, they are possibilities for at least halving the amount of emissions by 2030. So the, the possibilities are there. Next. And we can see that there is an increased evidence of climate action, both by countries that have already decreased emissions and also by targets that have been adopted by many cities and regions. Next. One picture that you probably haven't seen in previous report is this uh, picture here that shows the a summary of the cost and the potential mitigations for the energy sector. And you can see that, of course, some of them really could make a big difference. But of course, the price and the facility for implementation will be different from one region to another. Next. But part of the problem, of course, is the investment gaps. So not all countries are possible and can do this and they need help, but there is sufficient global capital for doing that. Next. And the next message, the last message that I want to take you is that it's not enough to just install more wind turbines or more uh, solar panels, but if we really want to make drastic changes, the whole energy system needs to be redesigned and the way that things function will be very different in the future than it is today. Thank you. Um, last, next time, that's the last one of my slides. Yes, but the evidence is clear. The time for action is now and the report really outlines a set of options that can be followed and uh, perhaps relating to this uh, meeting here is that all the disciplines need to work together, not only energy, but all the social science, all the physical science need to cooperate and talk to each other. And that is not easy to do, but we are trying. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for your presentation. We will now move to Guneri, please. Okay. So thank you for your invitation and thank you for this, this opportunity to present uh, a few highlights on the six assessment reports the working group two on impact adaptation and vulnerability. So I'm just one of the 270 lead authors of this working group two uh, report. And I, actually, I, I, I was involved in the chapter on Europe, in the cross chapter paper on Mediterranean region and the cross chapter box on sea level rise this is my field of research. What you see on the bottom are two coral reefs. The coral reef on the left is healthy, and the one on the right has bleached, probably due to marine heat wave events. This type of event is, we can see them more often since at least 2016. And uh, one of the great damage that uh, we can uh, expect from increasing temperature, and uh, if we exceed the 1.5 degree of global warming, is uh, more and more uh, coral disappearing in uh, tropical seas. And uh, so this is one strong motivation for keeping um, climate change below 1.5 degree of global warming. It is uh, to protect this type of ecosystem and for other risks that I will mention later. So the six assessment report and the working group two report informs government about consequences of their decision. It's not policy prescriptive. 
Uh, working Group 2 is the most recent and accurate synthesis on climate change impact and adaptation. 2070 households from 67 countries analyzed more than 34,000 scientific studies in four years with the help of uh, approximately 700 contributing households. And we, re we received 60,000 comments on this. And you can see the equilibrium in terms of women, men, and the developing country, developed countries now. So one key message from this report is that the science is clear. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. But this report offers also solutions to the world. So what are the key risks? I'm taking the key risks in Europe here, but actually they are the same at global scale. These are the the mortality and morbidity of people and changes in ecosystem due to heat. Uh, the heat and growth stress on crops and especially in Southern Europe. The water sparsity, especially in South Europe. And inland and coastal flooding due to more heavy uh, precipitation and due to sea level rise. Plus the cascading risks resulting from these key risks. So this includes, for example, forest fires during drought seasons. What we see is that despite progress on adaptation, impacts are being observed already. And what you see on the right is a figure showing progress of national adaptation in Europe. This is a self-report by countries, and they display a lot of progress in preparing for adaptation with laws and sync license, in assessing risks and vulnerability to climate change, in identifying adaptation options, and in monitoring and evaluating adaptation activities, mostly in Western Europe. But you, what you see is that the implementation of adaptation action at national levels is lagging behind in many countries. So there is uh, adaptation, but it remains uh, not transformative, uh, focused on a specific issue, focused on the present day risks and not on future risks. And so we are uh, lagging a bit behind in, the, in terms of adaptation. The climate responses uh, and the adaptation measures that uh, we have uh, listed in this uh, and evaluated in this report are generally beneficial for people and ecosystem. So you can see that in this uh, figure from the summary for policymakers. You can see uh, a number of uh, adaptation measures, like for example, integrated coastal zone management, uh, which can be beneficial for a number of, uh, of uh, sustainable development goals, including reduction of poverty, including uh, uh, quality education, gender equality, etc. You, you can see the same, for example, for green infrastructure and ecosystem services, which has obviously a lot of benefits for ecosystem, but it's also beneficial for health and well-being and other sustainable development goals. So what you see is that generally uh, adaptation measures that are listed in this report, that are evaluated, are beneficial for people and ecosystem. And this is just a selection of them here. So what can be our future in this context? So of course, we have missed opportunities in the past to reach higher climate resilient developments, but we can still, uh, there is still a pathway, although the window is uh, rapidly closing, to reduce climate risks, this is adaptation, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, this is mitigation, and this gives more time for adaptation, to enhance biodiversity by uh, keeping, for example, more space for, for ecosystems, and, and but to achieve the sustainable development goals by 230. And this is what we call climate resilient development. Thank you for, uh, for, 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 your, for your attention and thank you for your invitation. You can see my 270 colleagues here. Thank you so much, Gunnery, for that presentation. We will now hear from Jan Peter, please. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, and um, thanks for the invitation. Um, my topic is actually, are uh, European forests currently experiencing a shift in climate-related mortality? Um, a retrospective analysis across the last 25 years. Next, please. <clears throat> so, as we all know, um, forests are an absolutely um, valuable resource in Europe. Um, for um, income, but also for producing building material. But as we also know, um, during the last two decades or so, um, we have seen an unprecedented decline in forests um, due to 
climate change, pests and pathogens, and, and um, many other factors more. Next, please. So basically, um, what I'm trying to do today is to answer two questions. The first one is, um, do we see really an increase in mortality across whole Europe? And um, has soil moisture anomaly something to do with that, actually? Next, please. So what we are using is a um, huge network of ground observations on uh, ground defoliation. This is the so-called ICP level one ground condition survey where experts are assessing tree vitality each year across the continent. And we are trying to relate this to uh, soil moisture anomaly as obtained from the European drought observatory. Next, please. So this is one of our main results. Um, what you can see these um, increasing red lines um, represent increasing trends in mortality. And you see that we see an increasing trend in almost all tree species during the last 25 years, accompanied by a decrease in soil moisture anomaly, which you can see on the, on the blue lines, actually. Next, please. Um, one aim of our project is also to map mortality in order to show one important thing. So here's an example for Norway spruce because it's the most prominent example of massive tree decline during the last um, 25 years. And for instance, um, next please, one more, yes, exactly. Here you can see actually on this um, little map the, where the 2018 drought um, had its epicenter. And what we see is actually that while we don't see that much change mortality in 2018 itself actually, the consequences um, expressed in mortality rates seem to continue in 2019 and in 20. So you see many of these red points are actually accumulated in southeastern Germany, Czech Republic. This is exactly the area um, where you probably have heard from the news these massive calamities. But then when you see actually you have a look to the northern countries, Norway and Sweden, where the 2018 drought um, has worked, actually, you see that we see also increased mortality within the natural distribution of Norway spruce. And this is, this is concerning us, actually. Next one. So the um, second question was, does um, the change in soil moisture across the last 25 years um, is partly responsible for that pattern? And there's a clear answer, which is yes, actually. What you can see here is that um, drier conditions in the soil um, drive actually mortality or in this case lower the survival rate in trees actually so why is this um, the previous year soil moisture anomaly has an influence and the influence of the previous year soil moisture anomaly is even higher this is something which we call legacy effects or carryover effects so trees um, become more and more weakened actually and if the following year is also a dry year actually we know that um, pests and pathogens such as bark beetles actually um, can kill the trees. Next, please. So as a summary, actually, we see an increasing mortality trend in almost all tree species. Only silver fir actually um, is not showing such a trend. Soil moisture has significantly decreased across species distributions. This is also clear from our data. Um, and we see a significant, though a moderate, influence of the soil moisture anomaly on, on survival rates, actually. Next, please. Uh, well, some take home figures actually that you may easily remember. So when we compare the, the last 10 years of our observations to the period from 1995 to 2009, we see in Norway spruce an increase in 60% mortality, Scots pine 40%, 40% European beech 36%, and an oak 3.5%. This figure, which you can see here, there are two red lines one which marks 2012 and the other one which marks this zero line, which is the, somehow the baseline mortality. And what you can see when we calculate it over all three species, over all regions, we have a continuously positive trend in mortality since 2012, and it has not fallen below the zero line. So speaking in words of Andrea, actually, I can just confirm that we should have acted um, doing something yesterday rather than today, actually. Um, this is a really, really concerning trend that we see in European forests. Next, please. Yes, so some funding information. Um, this uh, work was funded by the Estonian Research, Research Agency. Next, please. And although I don't 
I don't, I don't can't show uh, 270 contributors, but at least um, I think they are five, six, seven, eight ones. Actually, these are the people who, who significantly contributed this work. Next, please. And of course, a big thanks to the ICP Forest Network because they are um, compiling this uh, huge data set of more, nearly 4 million observations that we analyzed during the last years. Next, please. Yes, and that's it from my side. This is my office, actually, if you are happy to answer questions via email or telephone or whatever. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan Peter, for your presentation. We will now have um, Jean O'Dwyer's presentation, who uh, is joining us virtually today. Good morning from Ireland, everyone. So uh, my name is Jean O'Dwyer, and uh, today, in conjunction with my colleague, uh, Dr. Carlo Sheik, I'm going to be presenting findings on our study looking at the impacts of extreme weather events on mental health and well-being. Or to put that a bit more colloquially, I suppose, is asking the question, can we actually cope with climate change? So just to give a bit of background onto the impacts of climate change on health and well-being, when we talk about climate change, one of the most tangible impacts, I suppose, is the increase in both the frequency and severity of extreme weather events. And we look at it from a, a human health perspective, we have both direct and indirect impacts. So a direct impact would be something like an increase in mortality or perhaps somebody losing their life from something like a flooding event. And we have a lot of data on, on this kind of, um, these kind of statistics. In terms of the indirect impacts, however, these are potentially more common and a lot more nuanced. And this inc includes things like increased morbidity and perhaps something that's potentially understudied is the impact of climate change or extreme weather events on mental well-being or psychological well-being. So that was the focus of, of this current study. So what we did was we did a global literature review where we collated all the data we could find from internationally peer-reviewed studies. Uh, in total, there was 59 articles included, which looked specifically at the impact of extreme weather events on psychopathological prevalence or morbidity. So if you look at the geographical distribution here, uh, the blue is the highest number, you'll see that there's, I suppose, a bias towards uh, Northern America, but there was also studies across Asia and, and Europe, which we have included. So when I'm talking about these psychopathological uh, prevalences or morbidities, what I mean here is that we included composite or any psychological impairment that was uh, published within the literature, and then through looking at the data, we actually teased out three specific areas, and these were uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, was more commonly known, uh, anxiety, and depression. So just to take you through some of the, the findings and the data, and there's a lot of kind of uh, busy tables here, but I'll talk you through it. What we found is that the majority of the studies tend to focus on things like hurricanes and storms. And this, I suppose, is a nod to the, the bias of a lot of the studies coming out from, from the United States or from Northern America. Overall, what we found is that investigations looked predominantly at direct or very acute events. So kind of a one-off event rather than looking at gradual changes over time, which is potentially a little bit of a, a knowledge gap moving forward. Crucially, very few studies looked at independent control groups. And what I mean here is that ideally, if you want to see if an event impacted a population, you would interview them using a psychologically appropriate metric on say a Monday, an event would happen to them on a Wednesday, and then you would reassess on a Friday. So you get very distinct information as to event-based causative factors for psychological distress. Most studies didn't include that, well, mainly because there are such sporadic events, it's hard to, to get this kind of data. Um, but we do have some of them, which I'll talk about at the end. So lack of control in literature is a key finding. And if we want to kind of improve research in this area, we have to be more cognizant of monitoring the well-being of populations over time so we can get a better idea of whether extreme weather events actually impact people. But if we do look at the studies which looked at the prevalence or the morbidity associated with psychological impairment following an extreme weather event, we can put out some information. So we can see here that populations that were exposed to multiple events show a higher morbidity than those exposed to a single event. And this stands to reason really and kind of suggests that countries where extreme weather events will be even more frequent are potentially at a higher risk of being psychologically impaired. 
<clears throat> we also found that studies where the population was dominated by females or minorities, a higher morbidity was associated with that. And this is a key risk factor. So in terms of gender, anyway, all is not created equal in terms of the impacts of extreme weather events on psychological impairment. We also found that adults and specifically the 31 to 50 year olds seem to be more affected in other age groups, hypothetically, potentially because of increased financial burdens. Um, and we also found, as we generally do a lot of uh, across a lot of health related research, is that lower income countries may be more impacted than higher income countries. Um, and this potentially is one, because they may be more likely to have extreme weather events, and two, because of lack of resource, resources and our infrastructure. If we look at it across the three domains, which I mentioned, PTSD, anxiety and depression, we saw a similar kind of story where the females and minority groups were disproportionately impacted um, in terms of these three domains following an extreme weather event. And interestingly, under these three things, we found that actually higher income countries seem to, um, seem to display higher levels of PTSD, anxiety and depression following an extreme weather event relative to lower and middle income countries, potentially due to lack of resilience or, or myriad other factors. So I mentioned earlier that the lack of the control group was, was an issue within the studies, but there were some that included that included this controllability, where you could look at what, what people were experiencing prior to an event and after. So out of the 59 studies, there were seven of them, which arguably isn't enough, so more research needs to be done. But there's some really valuable information from these seven studies. And what's reported here is what's called an odds ratio. And that's a bit jargony, but to put that very simply, it's just the, the likelihood of something occurring. And this is looking at the likelihood of a psychological disorder following an extreme weather event. And you can see here that the numbers here are quite varied, but if we look at the worst case scenario here by this study published in 2014, we calculated an odds ratio of 16.73. So what this means is that people who have experienced an extreme weather event are almost 17 times more likely to have a negative outcome, i.e. a psychological disorder resulting <clears throat> from that extreme weather event. So just some take home messages from this study. So I think that we can kind of conclude now that extreme weather events not only cause destruction to property um, and things like that or increase mortality, they also have an impact on morbidity and particularly true psychological impacts. The analysis indicates that there's regional trends. So we see higher impairment among residents of low income regions if we look at it at a composite level. And then if we pull out or tease the information about PTSD, anxiety and depression, that tends to be more focused in higher income settings. Generally, we have found that there's a higher health burden associated with marginalized populations. And consistently across all the domains, we found that the female gender had a higher risk of psychological impairment. So to put it all in a nutshell, I think that I kind of conclude that when we talk about climate change, it's this kaleidoscope issue. And really, we can no longer view it simply through an environmental lens. So it is very clearly impacting and will, unfortunately, for, for many, many years, continue to impact people, which is all of us. So that's it for me. Thank you for listening. So this is the journal that paper is published on if you're interested in reading it. And if you have any questions, I'm here for this anyway, or you can give me an email at the contact details you see on screen. So thank you for having me and thanks for your time. Thank you, Jean, for your presentation. We will now move on to Leah. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I will show to present the project I worked on uh, during my Erasmus period at LSE, uh, which is about climate change and eastern winds or the effects of shore wind energy availability. Next, please. Um, in Europe, uh, offshore wind energy is playing a key role uh, in the transition to renewable energies and its usage is expecting to increase uh, in the next decades. Extreme weather conditions with no winds uh, or winds uh, too strong uh, can heavily affect uh, the turbine operation, interrupting the energy production. Uh, in Europe, the occurrence of these events uh, is related uh, to the occurrence of uh, the extratropical um, cyclones or anticyclones, uh, so that changes uh, in their intensity or frequency can cause changes uh, in the occurrence of uh, intense storms uh, or low speed wind events. 
so what we wanted to investigate was the behavior of extreme winds events over Europe, in particular over the period 1950 to 2020, uh, to analyze the weather regimes related to them and to investigate uh, their impacts. Next slide, please. So what we did was uh, we um, uh, selected from our analysis data set with speed values at 100 meter uh, over the period 1950 to 2020, and we filtered the speed, well, speed values uh, over the so-called cutoff threshold, which is equal to 25 meter per second, because uh, over these uh, values, uh, the turbine stopped working, and uh, uh, we selected the values uh, under the cutting uh, wind speed equal to three meter per second for the same reason. And we focused in particular on five areas um, identified by the black boxes uh, in the picture, which are UK, Denmark, the areas uh, in the north of Spain, south of France, uh, and uh, over Greece. Uh, with this uh, filter data set, we used a statistical test uh, to detect uh, significant trends in the occurrence of uh, high speed and low speed wind events during the whole year over the period considering and a piece for winter months and summer months. Uh, regarding the weather regime analysis, uh, we divided the period uh, into sub-periods, uh, past and present, uh, and we analyzed the climatology of the geopotential 8 uh, uh, for the present and the past uh, to detect the weather regimes, uh, and we uh, computed the differences uh, between uh, present and past anomalies to detect uh, changes uh, in their patterns. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, what we obtain is that uh, uh, actually we found uh, significant trends uh, in the occurrence of uh, high speed winds uh, and low speed wind events. Uh, for example, the case uh, in the pictures uh, is the one about uh, the UK, uh, for which we found uh, a significant decreasing trends uh, for high speed winds and uh, uh, decreasing trends for low speed winds. Next, please. Uh, regarding the weather regimes, uh, we found that for high speed winds, uh, uh, different zones are related to the same weather regimes. Uh, and uh, as shown in the pictures, the gradient between uh, positive and negative anomalies is accentuated between uh, past and present, uh, leading to stronger winds uh, and a higher frequency of these events. Uh, for the low spin winds, uh, we found blocking patterns centered over the specific areas considered. And uh, we detect uh, a lower frequency in uh, all the regions, uh, except for in Greece, uh, where we found an extension of the positive pressure areas, uh, leading to um, uh, an increasing trend of, um, of these low, low speed winds. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, with this result obtained, uh, we can say that uh, planning new, farm, new wind farms uh, in Europe should take into account uh, the behavior of the extreme wind events, uh, because actually climate change has already affected the uh, wind energy availability. And uh, uh, it will be really useful uh, to implement in European policies for the energy ma management to avoid blackouts or shortages uh, in the energies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leah. We will now um, hear from our last speaker for today, which is um, Lizette, if you're ready. Thank you. <clears throat> well, first of all, I would like uh, to thank you for giving us the opportunity to present our research here at the press conference. This press moment, which is called to the boiling point for far reaching uh, the far reaching effects of climate change and one of these effects is of course um, heat extreme heat events are becoming more frequent and more intense and we need to adapt our cities to these uh, to the ri risks involved and i will present a design guideline that we developed to adapt our cities and to become heat resilient we did our research at the University of Applied Sciences. But first of all, I would like uh, you to yeah, realize again that um, heat is an actual and existential threat. If we open up the newspapers, then we see, for instance, the extremely heat events in uh, Pakistan and India at the moment. And um, it said that uh, this deadly Indian heat wave made 30 times more likely by the climate crisis. And we also see uh, in Spain um, extraordinary uh, heat events in this month. And also, yeah, closer to my uh, home country, 
we have uh, had very hot events over the last years and people were really advised to stay indoors, uh, which is really, uh, yeah, uh, new. So um, to protect people and nature, really strong mitigation and adaptation actions are needed. Now, with respect to climate adaptation and ad adaptation to heat, we can see or distinguish three levels of adaptation measures. Um, we can first of all uh, take uh, adaptation measures to the uh, urban areas, which means we can design our urban areas differently, uh, cooler. But we can also uh, apply or yeah, do interventions at the building scales, meaning that we can um, create cooler buildings. Um, we can yeah, uh, take interventions to keep our buildings cool. And there are also uh, adaptation measures at the level of the inhabitant, which deal with um, uh, behavior or um, uh, health programs or heat health warning systems. Now it's the urban area where this is where our research is about. And luckily in the Netherlands where we are from or where I am from, um, climate proof planning or climate proof urban areas is in our policy because we formulated a Dutch Delta program some years ago, which stipulates that from 2020, water resilient and climate proof planning must be embedded in all policies and actions of municipalities, of water boards, provinces, and national governments. So this is policy, but then uh, municipalities and actually local as well as uh, national uh, authorities started discussing yeah, what is actually heat resilient planning how can adaptation to heat be effective and uh, how can adaptation to heat be effectively implemented in urban design guidelines what is actually heat resilient so to answer these questions we started the research project some years ago and we finalized it as well um, which dealt with the research questions heat resilient what is yeah what is actually the problem of heat in cities what are effective measures and how uh, and what are the effective design guidelines now in this project we um, found out that municipalities they want for yeah they want on one hand clear guidelines and standards uh, with respect to heat but they also need freedom to decide and design their cities so we came up with three guidelines, and one of these guidelines is distance to cool spots. And I will explain to you more about this design guideline. And the other two design guidelines have to do with the percentage of green and the percentage of shade in, are, uh, in urban areas. Now, the distance to cool spots, it's actually a very simple but very effective design guideline for cities. It says that each house or each inhabitant should be within a 300 meter uh, distance to an attractive cool spot uh, outside in an urban area. Now, why did we chose 300 meters distance? Well, this is a sort of flip-flop distance. It's easily walkable. Also for elderly people, it's a, a distance that can be um, walked slowly <laughs> within five minutes. Um, and what is a cool spot? Well, we, together with municipalities and with uh, other researchers, we agreed upon an area of at least 200 square meters. Um, that's a cool, sp that can be a cool spot. And in this cool spot, we can calc, uh, it should also be below, uh, it should have a temperature during a very hot day, um, uh, with a perceived temperature below 35 degrees. It's something we can, we can calculate. Now, um, we can also, uh, it's a yeah, very practical uh, design guideline that we can also um, uh, yeah, visualize in a map. So here you see the design guideline 
um, visualized in a map of Amsterdam. But actually for the whole of the Netherlands, we have pointed out this design guideline. And in this map, you see the cool spots uh, um, illustrated in blue, and the colors indicate the distance of each house to a cool spot. Now, you can see that a, a large part of the uh, city center of Amsterdam is indicated by red, which means this area is probably vulnerable uh, to heat and is not designed heat resilient so far. So these maps really give us an insight in which areas are vulnerable, where are the cool spots located, and where is adaptation needed. So this map is available on the uh, link in the left corner below, um, and is also used by many municipalities and provinces in the Netherlands to, well, to define and to, and to develop their cities heat resilient. Now, one of the criteria for a cool spot is, of course, the area and if it's cool enough. Uh, but there are also other criteria because a cool spot should also be um, comfortable and pleasant during um, a summer day but, uh, or a hot day, but actually also throughout the whole year. So we, there are other criteria you can define. Um, for instance, that it should be calm and clean, that there should be benches where you can sit there should be a, a, a water tap, playgrounds, or a nice view. So you can come up with other criteria as well. These are not really fixed. It is really a starting point for many municipalities to uh, discuss what is feasible and um, um, yeah, what is feasible and also uh, what the what the wishes are of uh, uh, inhabitants and, and the municipality itself. Um, so these criteria also make that cool spots can improve the livability of a city throughout the year. Now to wrap up, I would like you to remember that the distance to cool spots is really a practical design guideline for heat resilient urban areas, which is really used in the Netherlands nowadays, but um, I would advise other cities and countries also to experiment with this with this um, design guideline and it combines climate adaptation with improving the livability of a city throughout the whole year um, and then also i've already said this a couple of times it has been prescribed by many dutch local governments already and then last but not least and it has been mentioned by my colleagues as well heat is an actual and existential threat. We really have no time to waste. We should have started yesterday. Thank you so much, Elisette, for your presentation. We will now move on to the last part of our um, press conference today, uh, which is the question and answer round. So I now open the floor to questions, both to journalists present in the room and those online. Just to quickly recap, if you're in the room and if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will come and hand the microphone over to you. And if you are joining us virtually, feel free to either type your question in the chat or you can use the hand raising function on Zoom and we will call upon you for your question. I'm just going to hand over the mic to you. Thanks, Andrea, for your presentation. I was wondering, you talked about uh, photovoltaic cells and uh, lithium or uh, batteries. And I was wondering, uh, what is the effect of the lithium production on the battery production? And is this becoming an, an issue when we increase uh, our battery production, uh, battery production in the next years? Mm, yes. Um, thank you for, uh, very much for the question. And um, uh, maybe as you're aware, this is 
uh, in, in the report number three, we were almost nearly 300 uh, experts that wrote the report and many others that contributed and help. And of course, that's just really well outside my area of expertise. So I will, I will point you to perhaps to contact uh, some of my colleagues in the energy chapter that, that work directly with that kind of technology. Um, my area of expertise actually it's on wind energy, so, uh, so that will be <laughs> something that I could, you know, easily answer. So thank you for your question. Just to add on to Andrea's point, um, all of the press kits have the email addresses of um, the speakers. So if you would like to contact them after the briefing, um, they can put you in touch with someone who could then better answer your yes, question. And, and I can uh, easily, if you email me, can point you to the person that it's really an expert on, on solar technology. Right, do we have any other questions coming in? Okay, we have one more. for the presentation so i would like to have uh, one question for the second speaker uh, mr john neri uh, so you were saying that like the adaptation in some country uh lag behind so what is strategy to bridge this gap and uh, in the uh, the report a uh, working group too uh, did you when you draft like some a uh, lesson learned from other countries so that the other country can follow. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, actually, it's uh, one subsection in the summary for policymaker. It's uh, the section on the enabling conditions. So what are the conditions that enable adaptation? And so there is a review of uh, successes uh, so far. And uh, usually what we see is that uh, um, the, the, the successful experiences that we have in terms of adaptation uh, take place where adaptation has been uh, involving a lot of people. So there is a participatory process to, to make sure that the adaptation solutions that are in place are uh, well aligned with the uh, development priorities, with, uh, let's say, the values that people place in different assets or ecosystems, etc. And uh, this is one important enabling condition. There are other enabling conditions like finance and like in the working group three report where uh, my colleague showed there is a, a gap in financing mitigation. There is also uh, uh, an adaptation finance gap uh, and the adaptation needs in terms of finance are projected to at least double um, by 2030. So yes, th th there is material on this. Uh, and, and this is really in the summary for policymaker. This is a section of enabling conditions. Do we have any more questions coming in? Okay, one more question. So I have a question for you, sorry, I don't remember your name. So um, uh, how much each single extreme events like a heat wave or a drought contributes to the mortality or, or, or uh, on over the trend? I mean, is, is this mortality is driven by the droughts or the heat waves or is a trend that is uh, the long-term signal of uh, the moisture? Um, so actually, what we did is we um, modeled um, soil moisture anomaly actually was an agricultural drought indicator. Um, so this of course includes temperature as one variable, precipitation, it's actually a whole rainfall runoff model actually, which specifically models um, soil moisture in two distinct soil layers actually. But then we express as an anomaly from the long term mean actually, okay. So and then we can say there's an, like a common definition that you say, well, like my, minus one standard deviation below, below the mean actually is a mild drought and 1.5 is a severe drought and, and everything which is below minus two is already an extreme drought, okay? So, um, and therefore I, I, I can't really say whether it's um, a heat wave or precipitation, it's the whole thing together actually because heat can drive um, a drought lack of precipitation can and wind speed can so they are all somehow compiled in this in this indicator actually yeah 
Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Okay, we have a question from um, a journalist joining us online. Um, I will ask our press assistant Wong to please ask the question. So from the online participant, we have one question from Zem Desi. So the question is for Lizette. Uh, would you recommend would, re, would the recommended distance to the cool spot vary depending on the city climate? For example, that is depend on the extremely temperature. Um, thank you for this interesting and good question. So as I, uh, so what I understand, um, Maybe we should make our distance to the cool spot dependent on the climate. Um, uh, well, maybe shorter for climates where which have e extremer heat events than the cooler climates. I think it's a good suggestion. I'm not sure if it's feasible, uh, but would be something to, well, to take, take home and to see how this can work out. Yeah, as I said, these design guidelines or the definitions are just uh, the definition is just a starting point. You can really well discuss this in your own country, in your own city, um, how it should look like. Mm. Thank you. Any more questions coming in? OK, I'll just hand over the mic to you. Hi, um, I have a question and I heard there are apparently two experts on wind energy and I was wondering if there are significant trends in uh, the high speed as well as in low wind speed, if that, and maybe I've missed it, if that also influences the advices if a uh, wind turbine should be placed more um, inland or more uh, on the sea. Um, for example, in the Netherlands, that's a huge debate that is uh, going on right now. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, well, of course, uh, um, having detecting these trends, uh, it should be uh, taken into account uh, for the displacement of new wind farms. Uh, in my project, uh, I just worked on uh, offshore wind farms, uh, but uh, I think that uh, the same uh, the same analysis uh, should be done also for placing uh, wind farms uh, uh, on shore, so over the lands and. Uh, well, that's it. I think that uh, it should be needed uh, an analysis also of this, of this uh, to to choose uh, if place the wind farms on offshore or onshore. Thank you, Andrea. Would you like to add yeah, to that? Maybe I would like to complement that. Uh, you know, the, the most of the actually energy that it's produced in Europe now through. Uh, to, uh, wind is onshore, it's on land, only a small fraction, fraction is, is offshore. Uh, however, offshore we find that you know, winds are more constant, they, they blow most of the time, so the conditions of no wind are actually rare, especially when you move above the ground, you know, the new wind turbines are in the order of 150 or 200 or higher, and then you have more constant winds uh, but at the same time, the conditions offshore are really tough for wind turbines. It's not, um, you know, the winds are strong, it rains hard, so they are, they are uh, the possibilities of them having faults and things increase. And of course, the price of repairing it and the price of bringing people out to the field to do it. So there is a compromise and it's, it's difficult to, to say, okay, you play something on land where also people live and they don't want them near themselves, right? But it's easy to come and fix them, but they produce less. Or you go offshore where turbines will produce much more, but they are more expensive because the, the environment is tough and because it takes much more to repair them. And they will probably live a shorter lifetime than they were in other regions. So it's difficult and it would depend on the on the uh, local conditions. But as you know, there was a meeting last week about where the governments of both 
Holland, Belgium, uh, Denmark, and Germany got together and they make a strong plan for building much more of uh, wind resources, uh, wind uh, extraction in the North Sea, which is an area which is very good for extraction of, of wind. Thank you for the question. Thank you both. Um, I'm just conscious that we are nearing the end of our press briefing time slot. So if there are any final questions. Okay, so um, with this, we will officially conclude with today's press briefing. I thank you once again for joining us. Um, just to remind you that if you struggle to connect with any of our speakers here today, feel free to drop me an email at media at egu.eu and I will do my best to put you in touch. Um, we have uh, two more exciting press conferences lined up today. Um, there's the Omnipresent Plastics, uh, Mountain Reverse to Microscopic Soils, which is at 2 p.m. And then um, the last one, which is an exclusive NASA press conference titled JunoCam and Citizen Science, NASA's mission to Jupiter. That will be presented by both NASA scientists and um, an independent scholar who's interested in astronomy. So um, I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you and have a good day.